folks, this is Pastor Mike Hunger coming to you from Watchmen Studios with another Watchmen video broadcast. We've been talking about the gods of gold and this idea that, you know, number one, God told Israel, don't make, don't make any gods out of gold, silver, brass, iron, there's your fourth kingdom, wood or stone. Just that, and that pretty much covers everything. Don't, don't make them, period. Don't fashion them out. And here's Moses up on top of Mount Sinai, and God is saying to him, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Bum, 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 right? The movie. While Israel is down at the base of Mount Sinai, pulling the earrings off, giving them to uh, Aaron, and Aaron has the gall to say, once this calf comes up, that's the story, right? And he told Moses, told his brother Moses, you know, that we threw this, we threw our gold in this pot, and all of a sudden this calf came up. Stranger thing. I don't think he was lying. Because that calf represents Antichrist rising up out of the fires of the pit. That's who that is. But Aaron had the gall to say, these be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee out of the house of Egypt. That was a lie, bold-faced lie. Okay, and so God says, I mean, that's exactly why. Moses cast the tables down, has to go back up again and start all over again. All right, so that's what we've been talking about. And this idea, God said, don't make these things, and he told it that for a reason. God, remember, the law protects us. When we put ourselves under God's authority, the law protects us. So the law was there to protect Israel, protect mankind from what he knew was what was really behind the gods of gold, that there are gods. And we, and, and we know that there's going to be a transformation of everybody on the earth, everybody. Some are transformed of incorruptible seed by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. There is another race, their transformation, just like the tares at the harvest, their transformation is based upon what they did with their DNA, right? They were born again or will be born again of corruptible seed. Fourth kingdom, they shall mingle themselves. Who are they? Gold, silver, brass, iron. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Seed of men, man's DNA, right? So think Bible here. And in case you're struggling with this idea, let me, let me show you some verses. This is concerning our transformation, right? And we know what heaven's made out of. Pure gold. Pure, pure gold. Like glass gold. We don't have even pure gold down here. It's not possible for some reason to make it. But up in heaven, we have tons of it, right? So follow me on this. Job 23.10. But he knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Stop right here. Remember a couple weeks ago when I started the Watchman broadcast out with reading 1 Peter, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, right? And that's, I mean, that's what I believe. I honestly, sincerely believe that a generation of believers, they're Faith is going to be tried by fire. But when he hath tried me, Job said, I shall come forth as gold. Now, let's, that's Old Testament. Let's go to Revelation and see what John saw and heard on the day when Jesus appeared to him, that day when he was you know, praying in the Spirit. Revelation 1.13, in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with what? 
a golden girdle. He was clothed in gold. But then, look at the next description in verse 20. This is Jesus, the mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are who? The seven churches. Now, you know, some people have a problem with this, and I can understand that. Some would liter literally define the letters to the seven churches as specific letters to these churches alone, and they're not for anybody else. I don't know, because, you know, Paul's letter to the Ephesians wasn't just to the Ephesians. You get what I'm saying? Paul's letter to the Corinthians, all four of them, wasn't just to the Corinthians. It's part of, it makes up part of our doctrine. So what if the seven churches represent the entirety of all of the church throughout all ages? The number seven being the number for perfection and completion. The number seven being the number for the seven spirits of God and the word of God, the phrase word of God in this Bible 49 times, seven times seven. Love it. Okay, so you, you but you understand what I'm saying here. The seven, the seven golden candlesticks were who? The church people, the church. Transform and where's Jesus in the midst of them? And he, you know, he said, Where two or more of you are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of you. Okay, so you know, it just looks like this idea that when we are transformed, because our mother the, of our second birth is Jerusalem above, which is the mother of us all, and she is pure gold. Okay. So, you know, just kind of think along those lines. As we look at this next story, news article, about gold nanoparticles and the process of how you get CRISPR using gold nanoparticles to do what CRISPR does. And what does CRISPR do? CRISPR takes parts, of, and I'm not going to do this. CRISPR takes part of the book of DNA and... Takes it out. Like the, um, the Bible Society did with the Greek text. They just took stuff out. Oh, Jesus Christ, that don't belong there. Lord Jesus Christ, that doesn't belong there. Uh, Son of God, that doesn't belong there. They just took stuff out. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Took it out, threw it out. Okay, so the same thing now, we, now we've, we've been changing the Bible for years. Now we've learned how to change DNA. We've learned how to do it better. And as if CRISPR wasn't easy enough, now they figured out a better way using gold. Fred Hutch, scientists on how gold nanoparticles can bring CRISPR to the developing world. Now, I, I understand this. We minister in Kenya and other places and we want to help those people. We want to give them food. We want to try to do what we can for them, pray for them, minister to them, give them the gospel, give them the truth so they can be free. Okay? God, take care of the rest. We, but we're doing what we can. And what they've done is they, they want to go into third world nations in African communities where sickle cell anemia is a killer. And, and AIDS is too, by the way. So they want to go and help, but they, so they want to change. White people can't get sickle cell, is why I'm saying this. So they go to Africa to treat sickle cell anemia with CRISPR. Using gold nanoparticles. Instead of a virus, instead of, because that's what CRISPR was, the Cas9 system was basically a viral delivery system because viruses know how to get into cells where they don't belong. Like Jude, 
Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm getting revelation from God. Hallelujah. Glory. Amen. Uh, like Jude said, Jude said, um, verse 4, For there are certain men crept in unawares. They infiltrated, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, like a Jesuit priest sitting on the Greek New Testament committee, and others like him turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So they crept in unawares. They infiltrated where they didn't belong to change and alter the gospel. That's what this is. And again, my heart goes out to third world nations. We, again, we want to minister, but people die. Everybody's going to die. It's appointed that a man wants to die and after this, the judgment they want to cure death. That's what's behind this. They want to experiment on the third world to see how well it works before they strike, start trying it on the first world. Genetically editing cells using CRISPR could be the answer to curing genetic disorders such as sickle cell anemia. But in order for the technology to be available for people in countries like Nigeria, where around a quarter of the population carries the sickle cell trait, the technology will need to become substantially cheaper and less invasive. Sounds humanitarian, doesn't it? But this is all about experimentation upon poor people. Okay? I'm not some social justice warrior. I'm just telling you how it is. When you read the Bible enough, you, especially the book of Psalms, and you'll see that the wicked who have the wealth of the world, how they treat the poor, okay? So scientists at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center Research Center are devising an approach that vastly simplifies how CRISPR is applied. Their goal is to create a safe process for gene editing that takes place entirely within the body of a patient. Later on down, it says the researchers think they figured out the first step, which is delivering CRISPR to blood stem cells inside the body. They're doing that using gold nanoparticles that are about a billionth the size of a grain of a table salt and able to, sm to smuggle in RNA, DNA, and a protein. Smuggle in. Certain men crept in unawares. To smuggle in to the cells, the alteration of the DNA that's in that cell. The part that they say, we don't like that part. So let's take that out. It's whether you're black or white, you still have the curse of sin built into your DNA. Everybody dies. Black or white, doesn't matter everybody's going to die and it's the curse of sin and whether you're black and you and you have a trait in your genes that could possibly develop into sickle cell anemia or you're white and you're going to die of cancer either way you're going to die so i mean it's not a black white issue it's built into all of us and i'm telling you it's, there's things in here like the Bible, like God telling Adam, you eat of the fruit of that tree, you're going to die. So he broke the law and he did it. God said, you're going to die now. Satan is the one who came and says, not so fast. Not so fast. I think I've got a cure for your death. Just eat the other fruit and you shall be as God's and you shall not surely die. So watch this now, because you know viruses. Viruses are basically just strands of RNA, single strand, um, and it gets into cells. And it's always been supposed for years, and they even made one of the, um, and I talked about this on Pastor Mike Online here a while back, they made one of the, uh, the Jason Bourne movies, but it didn't have Jason Bourne in it. But it was about 
a CIA guy whose genetics had been altered. He was a super soldier. And they were, he, they were using meds to keep his genes altered. But they were going to shut the program down trying to kill all the guys. And he was going to die because he wasn't getting his meds. And so he wanted a way, he, he found a scientist for the CIA that, that knew that they had found a way to deliver the permanent transformation of these super soldiers by way of a virus. It's been known for years that you could use a virus because viruses are really good at getting inside the cells. Okay? So watch this. The nanoparticles are big enough to carry the CRISPR payload but small enough to infiltrate cell membranes. Gold is a useful medium since it isn't harmful to humans. It's basically the gods of gold giving us the promise that we are going to cure death. And how are we going to do it? We're just going to alter everybody's genes. Now, there's another verse in the Old Testament. I've seen this verse for years, and I'm just going, I think it means exactly what it says. God, God told him, don't make these idols. Don't do it. Don't, and don't make them, and don't pray to them. So in Psalm 115, here's what God said. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have, look at that. Man's making a God, all right. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is every one that trusteth in them. Now, while I was reading that verse, I was counting. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. Ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. The seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars, seven angels, seven golden candlesticks are the seven churches. Here, you have idols that have seven things, but they're useless. And then he said, and this is God, saying this, they that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. Just as we bear the image and will bear the image of our Lord Jesus Christ throughout eternity, they also bear the image of who? They're gods of gold. I want you to take a look at some pictures I gathered for you. See that on the left, that left picture, that gold Buddha there? That thing's got to be, what, 150 feet tall? Overlaid with gold. And then around that platform are all these miniature gold Buddhas that are look to be about human size. And then surrounding, I, I don't have a better picture of this, but surrounding and I would say probably all on all four sides of this center golden Buddha are all these other smaller golden Buddhas. How much gold? How much gold did it take to put all that together? What's gold worth now? About 1200 bucks an ounce? Then you have this other statue, and you've got a smaller one at this this, I, this gold idol here, this one's got to be in size 50, 75 feet maybe tall. 
And these golden Buddhas are everywhere in, in the Asian continent. They are everywhere. See, God wouldn't let Paul go into Asia. Paul wanted to go east, and God said, no, you're going to go west. And that's what he did. We, and we're west of where Paul ended up, and it's, you know, it, it came west. That's why we're, America was a Christian nation. Okay, but get my point here. Paul wanted to go east to the Asian nations, and God wouldn't let him. Why? I think God knew that for the most part, these people are already sold out. They have these golden Buddhas everywhere. Let me, and let me explain a little bit about what I know about Buddha that might help you make a little sense out of what I've been saying. Buddha was a man, and I'm sure that he meant well. That's an old song from the 70s. I kind of revived. I like it. Because the Buddha was a man. He at one time was a wealthy prince. And whatever his flesh desired, his flesh got. But then he wasn't happy because everybody that has money and everybody has all that, they don't, they don't find happiness in that. You can't. So he wants enlightenment. He wants this inner peace. And he's looking around and sees all these, what they call ascetics in India. And these are men who become like statues, literally. Gautama the Buddha, started becoming living like an ascetic. These guys literally, I'm not making this up, study it out. They would eat a grain of rice a day and drink about that much water a day. And they would sit like these Buddhas sit, in some cases for days on end, never bathing, never shaving, never taking care of themselves, denying everything about their body total denial of the needs of the body, not just the pleasures, the needs of the body, because they were convinced that that's how you find God, find that enlightenment. So for a while, Buddha does that, and he figures out that's not really the way either. And I don't, I don't remember the conversion part of it, but he was sitting under a tree. They know where the tree is. He was sitting under a tree, and all of a sudden, he got this enlightenment. Now he's a god. A man, Gautama, became the enlightened one, the God. Man becomes God. And that's the religion of Buddhism, is that if Buddha can do it, so can you. Okay? Uh, but it's not just Buddhism I'm going after. I'm shooting after all of, look at this, Virgin Mary statues everywhere around the world. There's over one billion Roman Catholics and every Catholic church. I've been in one, been in a couple of them in my life. First time I went in one, I was a teenager and I was awestruck at the gold in that place. And it wasn't one of these big city Catholic churches. I was awestruck at the amount of gold in this church. And these gold, not just the gold statues, gold on the walls. It's supposed to be because she, she is decked with gold, right? Okay. And then you have, like here, these Catholic churches. She is decked with gold. Now, you have all these liberals saying, if we would take the money we spend on making weapons and we would feed starving people and we would give them health care, and we would give them uh, free money, uh, then we would solve all of man's problems. I say, let's go after, before we start dealing with, you know, selling all of our weapons, I say we go to every one of these religious institutions, chip off every ounce of gold, 1,200 bucks an ounce, chip off every ounce of gold they got, I guarantee you, you'd have enough money to feed everybody on this planet. Makes me angry. But God said, God said, they that make them and they that pray to them will be like them. 
And I think he meant exactly what he said. Exodus 34, Take heed unto thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, cut down their groves, for thou shalt worship no other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, with a capital J, is a jealous God. Lest they make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go, and I want you to concentrate on this word here, go a-whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods. And one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice, and thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a-whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go whoring after their gods, thou shalt make thee no molten gods. Molten, you take the gold, you put it down, you refine it, you melt it down so you can cast your idol. Okay? But the phrase here was whoring. I mean, what does it mean? In, in a religious sense, it's when you claim to be, let's say you claim to be a Christian but you've decided that there are parts of Buddhism that you like. So you're going to incorporate yoga into Christianity in a philosophical manner. You have gone a whoring after the practices of another God. God did not send down yoga from heaven as a way to connect because that's what the word yoga means. It literally means yoke. And you're connected to the God. But God didn't give us yoga. God gave us prayer and Bible reading. It's that simple. So in a philosophical way, you go a-whoring after other gods by bringing their practices into your religious practice. Now you've got a combination of Christianity and Buddhism or Christianity and Islam, Chrislam, like Rick Warner, Warren does, and a bunch of others. So that's one way of doing it. But another way is to do it exactly the way you know how it's done. Okay? So God told him, don't do it. Don't make, don't cast these golden images. Don't make them, don't do, don't do. When you, when you go into the land and see what they've got, you're to break them all down, destroy every one of them. And don't go whoring after them. Leviticus 20, verse 2. Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. That, stop, stop, right here. That's what happens to the fourth kingdom. That's why he said, do that. He said, any of the people that sojourn in Israel that giveth any of his seed, it means two things. His progenitors, the one, his offspring, his seed, his children, and it means his DNA. To Molech, and who was Molech? A god of gold. God said, he shall be surely put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. That's the fourth kingdom, because fourth kingdom gets destroyed by the stone cut out without hands. Jesus said, I am the stone. Um, he that falleth upon me shall be broken. That's us who fall upon Christ and are broken, and God remakes us. But he said, those upon whom the stone is fallen upon is grinded into powder. Remember that word, okay? Uh, and verse 3, And I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he has given of his seed, DNA, unto Molech, to defile my sanctuary, your temple, your body, and to profane my holy name. And if the people of the land do it anyways, hide their eyes from the man when he giveth of his seed unto Molech and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man and against his family and will cut him off. And all that go a-whoring after him to commit whoredom with Molech from among their people. God was serious. God said, this is a virus. I don't want it among my people. I will not have it. I am a jealous God. You might as well deal with it. And you can't bring in other religious practices that are not in this Bible into what we believe. He was serious about it. And he was angry. 
with Israel because after all the warnings and all the miracles he did for them, they went out and did it anyway. So Jeremiah 3 came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. Stones, any kind of stone, any kind of mineral. That's where we get the word mine from. We mine minerals. We pull up stones out of the ground. Could be iron, brass, silver, gold. And they go whoring after stones, stock. Stock is a piece of wood. It's a stick. That's where we get the word stick from. But they committed adultery with it. And I won't, I just don't like to talk about this, but you know, I'm going to warn some people now that because of the, the scriptures that we're using, I'm going to say a couple things. The computer, the consumer electronics show going on in Lost Wages, Nevada. And the big thing, the big thing that they're making now are robotic surrogates. I'll leave it at that. Robotic surrogates which are preferred over having a real person. You don't think we've turned into a nation of perverts? Ezekiel 16, 17, Thou hast also taken thy fair jewels of my gold and my silver, which I had given thee, and madest to thyself images of men, and didst commit whoredom with them. And that's what God says to, Israel, uh, to Jerusalem, the city Jerusalem. God said, My holy city, Jerusalem, has become a harlot. It's taken my gold my silver, committed whoredom with him. Mm, 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 mm. Ezekiel 16. Thus saith the Lord God, because thy filthiness was poured out and thy nakedness discovered through thy whoredoms with thy lovers and with all the idols of thy abominations and by the blood of thy children which thou didst give unto them, behold, therefore, I will gather all thy lovers with whom thou hast taken pleasure and all them that thou hast loved with all them that thou hast hated. And I will even gather them round about against thee and will discover thy nakedness unto them, that they may see all thy nakedness. And I will judge thee as women that break wedlock and shed blood are judged, and I will give thee blood in fury and jealousy. That is God in a killing mood. He was serious about it. He said, you went and committed whoredoms to these gods of gold. This Bible is still right, and it's still as relevant as it ever has been. We're doing it now just in a more modern 21st century way, but we're doing it. In every way feasible, we're doing it. Psalm 106, they serve their idols which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils. They shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan. The land was polluted with blood. Thus they were defiled with their own works and went a-whoring with their own inventions. And again, In fact, Las Vegas pretty much is the, the world headquarters for, you know, the Consumer Electronics Show always, I mean, it's a big thing in, and has been for years in Las Vegas. But also in Las Vegas, they have adult entertainment conventions. And again, the number one thing is surrogates, robotic, artificial intelligent surrogates. And God said they go a-whoring with their own inventions. Now, 
Remember the, the, um, the logo for CRISPR Gold. Remember, let me go to this graphic here. Remember what it was? You can clearly see the DNA is mingled. Just like the meaning of the square and compass in Freemasonry. I'm bringing that back up again because the literal meaning of these symbols is that which is on earth literally mating and joining and becoming one with what was in heaven. Okay, that's exactly what it means. And it's exactly what God said, don't do. And in Daniel, everything about Nebuchadnezzar's dream and his vision of the fourth kingdom was about that. Daniel 2.31, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image, this great image whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image, his head, was of fine gold, his breast, his arms, of silver, his belly and thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet, part of iron, part of clay. So verse 43, Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with, my, with clay. Now I bring this back to your attention again because I found something in, it's my go-to book. And I've got thousands of books, either in print or PDF. But one of my number one reference points is the man who's already done most of the hard work for guys like me, Manly Hall in Secret Teachings of All Ages. Because here's what he said about Nebuchadnezzar's image. The Sephirothic tree, you know what that is, that's the Jewish mystic Kabbalah tree of life, is sometimes depicted as a human body, thus more definitely establishing the true identity of the first or heavenly man, Adam Kadmon. The idea of the universe, this is, and it's, this is Antichrist people, the ten divine globes Sephiroth are then considered as analogous to the ten sacred members and organs of the protogonos according to the following arrangement. Kether is the crown of the prototypic head and perhaps refers to the pineal gland. Chakma and Bena are the right hand and left right and left hemispheres, respectively, of the great brain. Chesed and Gevura are the right and left arms, respectively signifying the active, creative members of the grand man. Tiferoth is the heart, or according to some, the entire viscera. Netza and Had are the right and left legs, respectively, or the supports of the world. Jesod is the genitorib system, you know what that means, or the foundation of form. And Malkuth represents the two feet, or the base of being. Occasionally, Jesod is considered as the male, and Malkuth as the female genitorib power. The grand man thus conceived is the gigantic image of Nebuchadnezzar's dream with the head of gold, arms and chest of silver, body of brass, legs of iron and feet of clay. The medieval Kabbalists also assigned one of the Ten Commandments and a tenth part of the Lord's Prayer in sequential order to each of the ten Sephiroth. I'm just struck is what I am because the, the ten globes are ten kings, divine, not earthly, divine ones, gods, mingled with the 22 paths, which are the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, the 22 amino acids that make up the DNA code, so the 10 plus the 22 is the 32 with one extra hidden, the grand man, Adam Kadma, being 33. It's all about how they're going to make the beast, how he's going to be created. It is they mingling themselves with the seed of men. And Manly Hall knew it. He knew that Nebuchadnezzar's dream was all about that, okay? This also, from Secret Teachings of All Ages, the point within the circle, 
is the character of the greater and lesser worlds. Let me stop right and let me explain what he means. The greater worlds are all the heavens. The lesser world is us puny humans down here on this earth. So the big circle on the outside represents the heavens. The little tiny dot in the middle represents the earth. As the dot is surrounded by its circumference, this world is surrounded by Shemayim. Man, the little world, is included in this symbol because his inner nature is potential gold. Which gold is his eternal, indestructible spiritual body? Gold is the masculine principle of the universe. Do you get that? The gold being the masculine principle of the universe, that means the man, all humans down here are the female that the gold mates with to create Adam Kadmon, the grand man, the Buddha, the other Jesus, the Antichrist. Ezekiel 6, yet will I leave a remnant that you may have some that shall escape the sword among the nations when you shall be scattered through the countries. And they that escape of you shall remember me among the nations, whether they shall be carried captives, because I am broken with their whorish heart, which hath departed from me, and with their eyes, which go a whoring after their idols. And they shall loathe themselves for the evils which they have committed in all their abominations. Now, that's the Old Testament. All these places where God's, I mean, he just discarded Israel. That I was married to you. Here's your bill of divorce because I'm not getting married to you because you're not pure. You went out after, and Israel did. They went out, they didn't just bow to these idols, they brought in their philosophies and their doctrines and mingled it in with God's law. Same idea, okay? So now let's bring the New Testament into this. Hebrews 13, marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Now, I'm going to say this. There are a lot of people who love Jesus with all their heart and are born again who have been adulterers. Okay? I mean, that's just that's the nature of sin, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, whether you actually committed the act or you thought about it. Jesus said same thing. Okay? But they can be redeemed. It's not an unforgivable, unpardonable sin. All sin except for blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is forgiven. But look at think about the future now of what is going to happen. It's whoremongers and adulterers. And it's not just people on this earth. The final consummation of a grand marriage is going to take place, joining the heavens and the earth together. But it's the evil angels of the heavens with the evil people of the earth. That's how it's going to break. That's how it's going to happen. Acts 15, 20. But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. Acts 15, 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things that you abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. From which, if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. And the matter taken up in Acts 15 was, okay, these are Gentiles. Do they have to keep the law? Because we didn't keep the law. Let's not lie about it. And they decided, you don't keep the law to get saved. That's the whole purpose of salvation is because we can't keep the law. So we say, you know, you, obviously, you don't keep the law to be saved. But that doesn't mean you just go out and do whatever you want to do. So we're going to give you four. Remember the four Gospels? It's four things here, four necessary things. And they're all prophetic about what is going to take place because they're all connected pollution of idols, fornication, things strangled, and from blood. They say it in the letter, meats offered to idols. That's the Catholic Mass. 
and I haven't studied other religions, but I know, I know that in lots of other religious ideas, there is this idea of the ingestion of a god to become the god. It's the same principle, same idea. God said, don't do it. He mentions fornication here, and number one, you abstain from that. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm, I'm all about that. And God, I promise you, if you are a child of God, and this is an issue with you, I promise you, God will chasten it out of you with a rod. He will. I promise you. Okay? He's done it for lots of people before, and he'll do it for you because he means to, the rod is God's purifying method of us to get us to stop doing all the stupid stuff that we've done all of our lives. Okay? So, now, back to Exodus 32 and that golden calf. Do you remember what happened to it? When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and of your sons and of your daughters. Bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And they received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. It's the Antichrist out of the melting pot of all the people, their gold earrings, part of themselves in that fire to refine out so they can make that molten calf. And Moses, Moses comes down and finds out about it. Moses is a picture of Christ. Remember what he did with it? Made him eat it. And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh into the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. Moses' anger waxed hot. And he cast the tables out of his hands and brake them beneath the mount. He took the calf which they had made, burned it in the fire, ground it to powder and strawed it, meaning he strewed, he threw it, tossed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. They ate their God, just like in the Catholic Mass and other such Masses. They consumed their God. And what does the Bible say Moses turned the God into? Powder. Particles. Are you with me? Here's another quote from the Secret Teachings of All Ages. In an old manuscript appears the statement that the Freemasonic Order was formed by alchemists and hermetic philosophers who had banded themselves together to protect their secrets against the infamous methods used by avaricious persons to wring from them the secret of gold making. The fact that the Hiramic legend, talking about Hiram Abiff, the man who built the temple for Solomon, contains an alchemical formula gives credence to this story. Thus, the building of Solomon's temple represents the consummation of the magnum opus. You know what that means? The great work. Remember my friend, Pastor Kelly. There's a lot of wisdom in that man. Came here and preached years ago. There's two religions. Do and done. Which one do we believe in? And I know a lot of people who would say, do. Nope. It's been done. The work of salvation has already been accomplished by one, Jesus Christ, because he said it is finished and he meant it. 
Freemasonry is like every other religion in the world. It says, keep doing, just like the Catholic Church does. Keep doing, you might get there. So that's what the word magnum opus means, great work, which cannot be realized without the assistance of Hiram, the universal agent, which is the Antichrist. The Masonic Mysteries teach the initiate how to prepare within his own soul a miraculous powder of projection by which it is possible for him to transmute. Do you remember, if you were like me, you in the 70s and 80s watching um, Battle of the Planets, and when the seven superheroes would turn into the fiery phoenix, he would go, transmute. They were using, alchem they were teaching us kids alchemical principles, turning the people into the phoenix, the gold. Mm. A miraculous powder of projection which, by which it is possible for him to transmute the base lump of human ignorance, perversion, and discord into an ingot of spiritual and philosophic gold. The philosopher's stone is really the philosophical stone, for philosophy is truly likened to a magic jewel whose touch transmutes base substances into priceless gems like itself. Wisdom is the alchemist's powder of projection, which transforms many thousands times its own weight of gross ignorance into the precious substance of enlightenment. Now, I'm going to bring in one more old guy here. You remember him? Fat Albert Pike. Hey, hey, hey. He was given a stipend, basically money, every month from the Scottish Rite Order to rework the 33 rituals of the Southern Jurisdiction Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. And he writes a book called Morals and Dogma, which explain what all of these rituals are all about. And in this book, he references this powder, and he calls it the divine powder, a little particle, a little spark of God. The philosophical stones say the masters must not be exposed to the atmosphere nor to the gaze of the profane, but it must be kept concealed and carefully preserved in the most secret place of the laboratory, and the possessor must always carry on his person the key of the place where it is kept. He who possesses the grand arcanum, which also means the great secret, is a genuine king, and more than a king, for he is inaccessible to all fear or empty hopes. In all maladies of soul and body, a single particle from the precious stone, a single grain of the divine powder, is more than sufficient to cure him. Let him hear who hath ears to hear the master said, and it just, oh, it irritates me that men like Fat Albert Pike and others bring in Scripture. They use the, the tongue of theirs to speak these heresies and then bring Scripture as if Jesus wants us to follow alchemy or yoga or any of these other practices. God said, God said once again, the idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. That gold nanoparticle that they figured out now can infiltrate the cell membrane get inside what is the tabernacle of the Most High God and rewrite the law, rewrite the book, rewrite the gospel. The truth of everlasting life is in this book, and they seek to rewrite it. They seek to infiltrate and rewrite it. It's that philosophical gold powder 
Moses turning that golden calf into powder, making them drink it, that was their curse, not their blessing. You see it now? It's God's of gold things real. I got a lot more. I got a lot more. Okay? Don't have time today. Let's call it a day. We'll put more out later on. All right? I love you. Continue to pray for our ministry. We thank you very much for your prayers, your support, the letters you write. I read them. I read the emails. I just don't have time to answer everybody back because I mean, this takes a lot of time. And it's worth it. And I appreciate you and I love you. You are the reason why we do what we do here at Bethel. I want you to know that. God loves you, so do I. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.